afternoon and welcome to our virtual gathering presented by the New Hampshire Preservation Alliance. We are the statewide membership-based historic preservation organization. My name is Beverly Thomas and on behalf of the Preservation Alliance, I'm pleased to welcome you to Old House Restoration Strategies and Challenges with Jim DiStefano. Today's program is a part of our Old House and Barn Expo on the Road series we launched back in March as our COVID safe replacement to our postponed 2020 Expo. We are wrapping up our Expo year, but do plan to continue our virtual programming next year as the Zoom sessions have been so well received. I know many of you have joined our past Expo on the Road sessions, but for those who have not, I'd like to mention a few housekeeping points before we get started. I ask that you please stay muted to keep the background noise to a minimum during the presentation. You may want to spotlight the speaker by choosing the side-by-side -side speaker option under the view feature and also turn your video cameras off to keep the internet connection as strong as possible. Today's presentation will run about 45 minutes and will be followed by a 15 minute q and I'll wrap up the program by one o'clock, but Jim has agreed to stay on until 1.15 for those of you who have additional questions. I'm guessing there'll be lots of questions, so please use the chat function during the presentation and we'll do our best to answer during the Q&A period at the end. And before we close, we'll select a lucky winner of today's door prize. And now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker. Jim DiStefano is president and founder of DiStefano and Chamberlain Inc., a structural and architectural engineering firm located in Fairfield, Connecticut. Jim is a professional engineer licensed in 22 states, a board certified structural engineer, and a registered architect. He has a strong background in the design of timber structures and the restoration of historic buildings. Jim is the author of Antique New England Homes and Barns, History, Restoration, and Reinterpretation, a wonderful resource book recommended for antique property owners. He lives in an antique home circa 1809 that he has lovingly restored and re-restored over the past 40 years. So at this time, I'm pleased to turn it over to Jim. Thank you, Jim, for joining us today. Thank you, Beverly, and welcome everybody. And uh, we're gonna be talking about restoration strategies and challenges today. And you know, perhaps you've acquired an old house that's down on its luck. It's been neglected over the years and you wanna restore it and do right by it, make it comfortable to live in, but maintain its charm and character. That's what we're gonna be focusing on today. First, I'd like to dispel a commonly held myth. And I often hear the refrain, they sure don't build them like they used to. And that's true, but I've come to appreciate over the years that house rights from 200 years ago were a whole lot like builders today. There were a small handful of them that were true craftsmen and took pride in their workmanship. And the homes that they built are the ones that have survived till today. But the vast majority of the old house, house rights didn't care so much about their workmanship. And they only did as good a quality work as they needed to for the structure to stand till the check cleared. And their houses long since perished, and we don't see those standing. So we have a disproportionate view of how houses were built in times gone by. So the National Park Service and the Secretary of the Interior have published guidelines for the preservation, rehabilitation, and restoration of historic properties. And if you're applying for historic tax credits, or you own a home that's a listed property in a regulated historic district, these are rules that are rigidly enforced. But for everybody else, they're just suggestions. And we're talking about the live free and die state. And it's rare that somebody is gonna tell you what you can and can't do with your own property. But I'd like to go through some of the more significant guidelines of the Secretary of the Interior. So the first one says that the historic character of a structure should be maintained and you should keep anything that 
is part of that original architectural character. You shouldn't be trashing elements that are significant to the architecture and are original to the house. And it's hard to argue with that one. I think that's easy to agree with. And this is an example of what not to do. Um, this is a project that my office was involved in some years ago. We weren't the architects, but they did some things here that violate that first rule. So what did they do right? This um, bay and window up in the attic that's referred to as a lunette, they kept that. And that's a marvelous feature. But the rest of the windows, these are all brand new Marvin windows. There's six over six windows, which are not necessarily period correct. The shutters were added. House didn't have shutters originally. The front door is new. The side lights and transom are new. The pent roof is new. This egress stair on the right-hand side, that was a new addition. But the house doesn't look bad, but it doesn't have a lot of the authentic stuff on it. And by all physical evidence, this house is no older than 1830. But that wasn't quite good enough for the developer. So what he did is he had a plaque made up for the front of the house that said historical building circa 1780. And he added 50 years to the pedigree of the house based on nothing, wishful thinking. And in fairness, most plaques on old houses overestimate the age of the house. And there's a lot of wishful thinking that goes into the dating. So whenever you see a plaque on an old house, don't give it any more credence than you would to something you read on Facebook. So a situation like this where architectural features have been incrementally removed kind of is reminiscent to the story the old timer tells of his grandfather's ax, where he's replaced the head once and the handle four times and still as good as no. When did it cease to be his grandfather's ax? And when does an old house cease to be an old house? Sometimes we over restore them and we love them to death. The next standard says that you shouldn't create a false sense of history. You shouldn't incorporate salvage elements from other buildings or conjectural features. Now, I got to tell you, I'm a rules are made to be broken kind of guy. And this one I have trouble biting by because I'm a dumpster diver from way back. I love to salvage stuff out of uh, particularly projects that we work on where features are tossed into the dumpster. And I love to salvage them and repurpose them. I can't drive to New Hampshire without stopping at the Vermont Salvage Exchange in White River Junction and seeing what stuff they've scrounged up lately that I might be able to repurpose. So I violate that part of the rule routinely. And conjectural features are something that are sometimes unavoidable. So what do we mean by a conjectural feature? Often you'll have a house that has been altered in the past and some of the original architectural features were removed at that time. And you may wanna restore it back to the way it had looked before, but you don't have any documentary evidence of what it actually looked like. You can't find old photos and whatnot. So you have to conjecture about what it might have looked at look like and take your best shot at it. So an example of that is, this is my own home. This is what it looked like when I bought it in 1981. And it was a little bit run down on down on slot. And it had this wing on the side of the house that was built in the late 1800s. And originally it had been open underneath. And in 1930, they put these casement windows in and enclosed it and made it a sunroom. For a variety of reasons, I decided to open it up again, but I had no photos of what it had looked like before 1930. So I had to do a little bit of 
searching to find the right answer. And my search led me in a couple of directions. On the lower right, you see a house in a nearby community, a couple of towns over, of a similar period. And it had this wing on the side that looked a lot like the addition on my house with this open portico underneath with archways in between the columns. And I figured, well, this is the direction I want to start pointing in. And then I looked at my own home and it had on the opposite side, a porch where you entered the keeping room that had these cool elliptical arches and a balustered railing. And I used those clues and the house in the adjacent community, and it came out looking something like this. Now, I can't say for a fact that's definitely what it had looked like, but I can say that it might have looked like that. And sometimes that's as good as it gets. So the next rule says that historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced wherever possible. And this really goes for windows because a lot of people when they have an old drafty house, the first thing they do is call that Anderson renewal salesman and replace all the windows in the house. And that's usually not the right thing to do. So if you have windows that still have the original sash, you really want to restore them and keep them rather than replacing them. We'll talk a little bit more about that later. The next rule says you should never, ever, ever sandblast anything. And I now believe that, but I didn't always. And I got to tell you, when I first bought my house, I thought it'd be really smart to remove all the paint off the outside of my house by sandblasting. And it ended up being the biggest mistake I ever made in restoring the house. The sandblasting damaged the wood and obliterated some of the moldings and pitted some of the window glass. Stuff you can't come back from. So this is something I now strongly believe to be true that don't even think about sandblasting anything. But that's not to say all abrasive blasting is bad. You should use the gentlest abrasive that will do the job you're trying to accomplish. So an example of that is my living room ceiling. I decide to expose the summer beam and joists, but they were kind of grungy looking when I took the plaster down. So I abrasive blasted them using ground up corn cob as the abrasive. And it did a beautiful job. And it didn't damage the wood. Um, I do have to tell you, I did a diligent job of enclosing the space with poly and taping the seams to contain the mess. But regardless of that, this stuff went everywhere. So when it, whenever you do any kind of abrasive blasting indoors, be prepared for some serious cleanup. <clears throat> Next rule says, protect archeological resources. And what you see in the photo are the tools of the trade of the archeologists. What archeologists love to do is dig through the ground, sift the soil, looking for artifacts, pottery shards, belt buckles, musket balls, arrowheads, whatever it might may be. And a treasure trove for an archeologist is a privy. Because in the day, people would drop things in the privy hole or intentionally discard things into it, things they didn't want to be found. So when an archaeologist stumbles upon an old privy hole site, that's usually an exciting day for the archaeologist, although none of the rest of us would have been so enthused by the find. Now, on my own home, over the years, I've had occasions where I've needed to have excavation work done, um, replacing the septic system, later putting a swimming pool in, and I always make a point of telling the equipment operator, keep your eye out for pottery shards and artifacts. 
But no, they never found anything. Next rule says that additions and alterations should be done in a fashion that at some point in the future, they can be removed and the old house is still intact, that you haven't lost or damaged anything. And the, the moral is everything you do ideally should be reversible. So those are the secretary's rules. And you can take those with a grain of salt. But now I'm going to go into my rules. And these are the ones that you really need to pay attention to. So the first rule is hire the best people that you can. There's a conventional wisdom that says when you hire a contractor or tradesperson or any other professional, you should solicit three bids and give it to the cheapest guy. And I got to tell you, no good can come from that. The best case scenario is you're left with barely adequate workmanship. The worst case scenario is you end up spending all the money you saved on attorneys to clean up the mess. So I strongly encourage you, seek out the best tradespeople you can find, negotiate a fair price with them, and don't be tempted to give it to the low guy. Probably the most important strategic decision you must make when embarking on a major restoration project is whether you should gut out the plaster or not, or leave it in place. That's a tough choice. The advantages of gutting the plaster is it makes life easy for the electricians and the plumbers and the ductwork installers to do their stuff. You can insulate the walls and ceilings much more effectively. You will uncover structural damage, insect damage, rot, whatever it is, and fix it. It doesn't remain concealed. The disadvantage, and there are multiple disadvantages. One is when you go to put sheetrock back on the walls, the old framing doesn't take the sheetrock very well. The framing's uneven. It's never 16 inches on center. So you'll find yourself doing a lot of fussing and shimming to get the sheetrock to lay reasonably flat. Now, the way they used to build houses, particularly in the 18th century and early 19th century, is they would put all the woodwork in first, hang the doors, put the casings, the baseboards, the mantles in, and then plaster up to it. Now, if you have a house like that, and this photo illustrates a situation, it's much easier to remove the plaster because you don't have to then remove all the woodwork and reinstall it, which can be a royal pain in the butt. Later houses, they put the plaster up first and then put the woodwork on top of it. And that's a bigger challenge if you decide to gut the place. If your plaster is in good shape and hasn't debonded from the lath and has a nice, interesting texture to it, you might want to keep it, work around it. But if it's falling off the lath, if it's in bad shape, you're probably better off removing it and working on the uh, or your building systems in a more controlled fashion. <sighs> Don't try and live in the house while it's being restored, particularly if you are hiring contractors to do the work, and particularly if you value your marriage and your children. Because if you try and live in the house during a major renovation project, your family will leave you. You will always be in the way of the contractor. The project will take longer and cost you more money. You'll be miserable and be living with plaster dust in your hair all the time. So move in with the in-laws, park a motor home in your driveway, whatever it takes, to get yourself out of the house while the major dirty work is being done. 
Now, of course, with that said, my own house, I didn't take my own advice. And I lived in it through the, the worst of it. But at the time, I was young. I was single. I was used to roughing it. And I was doing most of the work myself. So I wasn't in anybody else's way. But for the first few years, the only furniture in my living room was a table saw. And my guy friends got it. They thought it was really cool. But if I brought women home, they would be horrified. And they'd be convinced that I was untrainable and could never be housebroken. But it was fun having the workshop in the living room. This is another mistake that people make. When you do a, when you phase a restoration project, the first things you should fix are the building systems. You should make sure you've got a watertight roof on first, and then you should fix the heating system, the plumbing, the electrical, then you should insulate, then you should tackle the siding and the windows on the outside, and then you're ready to remodel the kitchen and put paint on the walls, and sand the floors. A lot of people are tempted when they first moved in to do the cosmetic stuff first, make the kitchen nice. But if you do that work first, when you go to fix the building systems later, you're tearing out all the early work that you did. So if you live with the place looking a little shabby until you've got the support systems in place, you'll be better off. My next rule says, remove everything that does not look like an old house. And this photo, it's easy to circle mistakes on this photo. So what do you keep and what do you lose, right? So uh, here we've got a lunette window. That's a keeper, that's a treasure. But you look at the windows, the windows are two over two sash, which are not original and not period appropriate. So this is a candidate for restoration windows, replacement windows. The asbestos cement shingles on the outside, that's got to go. Um, the window air conditioner on the side, not particularly charming. And this one story brick thing in the front, you know, what can I say? You know, it's got nothing redeeming about it. So peel away all the inappropriate stuff that was done after the original period of the house. But don't remove any original stuff. And if you have to remove an old piece of trim or whatever it is, for whatever reason, remove it carefully, pull the nails out of it, label it and throw it up in the attic. That's what the attic's there for, but save it for future generations. <clears throat> the temptation to spray urethane foam all over your house can be irresistible because you can quickly convert a drafty energy inefficient house into something that's moderately energy efficient with spray foam insulation but it's usually a really bad idea, particularly an old house and particularly on roof framing. Urethane foams can cause their own host of problems. Um, they trap water above them. So you can have a roof leak that goes undetected and you don't know anything about it until your entire roof structure is rotted away. You're much better off with things like cellulose insulation and things that are reversible. Urethane sticks to everything. And once it's there, you cannot get rid of it. Now, anybody know what this little trap door is on the side of the chimney? That was actually one of the ultimate kitchen appliances of its day. That's a smoke oven. And you find this occasionally in old houses. It was considered quite a luxury. And what people used to do is they would hang their, their meats, their bacon and their hams and whatnot inside the chimney and let the smoke cure it. 
and uh, it's kind of cool. So you'll open these trap doors and you see these poles in there that uh, stuff was hung from. Uh, usually you find these access, uh, access doors or a smoke oven in the attic, but sometimes you'll even find it in a stairway that runs alongside the chimney. Preserve the original windows. Um, if you have the original window sash, fix them, put storms over them. Storms aren't beautiful, but they'll protect the windows and give you a level of energy performance that's similar to a new replacement window. If you have to replace the windows, if you don't have the original sash, replace them with real restoration windows. So the, the window you see here is a restoration window. It's got true divided lights, but each of the individual panes is double insulated. Now, the thing you need to know about old windows to get the proportions right is that in the day, at any particular period, glass only came in one size. For instance, from, 1850, from 1750 to 1825, a span of 75 years, glass only came seven inches by nine inches. And that's the reason the old doubles hung and single hung sash were made up of multiple panes of window called lights divided by mountain bars. So this restoration window, it's a 12 over 12 and all the individual lights measure seven inches by nine inches. Now, if we pan back and look at the rest of the facade, what you'll see is a variety of window sizes. On the side, you've got some nine over sixes. You have the 12 over 12s in the front. Here's a six over six. Here's a six light fix sash. But every one of those windows, the individual window lights measure seven inches by nine inches. And that makes the proportions of the window look right for the period and everything gels. What you don't want to do is this. Here you see two 12 over 12 windows of very different size right next to each other. And each has very different light sizes. Now, what really makes this worse is this photo was taken of the visitor center at Old Sturbridge Village in Massachusetts, a living history museum, a place where people with old houses go for inspiration. And it's reprehensible that they didn't make the effort to get the details right. But this makes all the difference in the world. And a lot of people, they'll put replacement windows in and say, oh, it's an old house. I'll just make everything a six over six. And that never comes out looking right. An old window sash often has wavy glass in it. Usually that was cylinder glass. And it's got imperfections in it and it gives an old window character that you can't replace with a new window. So if you've got this old sash, it's worth saving. So most old houses have a certain amount of rocking and rolling in the floors and things that are leaning out of plumb. And realtors will tell you that's charming. And it's an old house, it's supposed to be that way. But the truth is that these deformations are all indicators of something going on in the structure that needs attention. They're signs of structural distress. Maybe it's rotted sills. Maybe it's a crushed column in the basement. Maybe it's a beam that was inappropriately removed or a tie beam taken out of the attic, whatever it is. So these are warning signs that there's something that needs attention. So you should heed them and fix the problem that's causing them. With that said, plumb square or level is not a realistic expectation. That even if you fix the underlying problem, the root cause, you're gonna be left with some resi residual deformation and distortion in the structure. You can reverse some of it by jacking, but if you take a hydraulic jack to your house, 
proceed with extreme caution because overzealous jacking can cause structural damage. So jacking should be done very slowly over a period of weeks. Put a little pressure on the jack and then sit back, let the house acclimate to it, come back a week later, take a couple more cranks on the jack and do it slowly. The house will talk to you. It will start making noises. It'll make snap crackles and pops. If it starts making loud noises, time to stop. You've gone far enough. Don't try and get everything true and level. You'll never get there. Bone dry basements are also not a realistic expectation. Old houses are often built with rubble stone foundation walls, often dried laid without mortar. These are inherently water permeable elements. And when it rains, some water is going to seep through. If you want to finish off your basement and put a media room down there or whatever, you're going to expend considerable effort to make it watertight. So this is what you have to do. You have to trench around the outside, expose the outside of the stone walls, pour concrete against them, waterproof that, put crushed stone, drainage pipe. If you do all that stuff, you'll have a reasonably dry basement. But Getting there is an adventure, and you've expended a lot of resources and effort to get to that point. It's better off to let the basement be a basement. Many old houses, most houses, old houses, I should say, have at least a partial crawl space under a portion of it. And crawl spaces are by far the most troubling part of an old house. It's where all the sins happen in the crawl space. It's not only a wildlife habitat for rodents and critters, it's usually got an earthen floor that brings a lot of dampness into a house. A lot of the moisture problems in an old house originate in the crawl space. You may see mold growing on the sheetrock in the attic and think the moisture is coming from the roof when in fact, it's probably originating in the crawl space and rising up through the house and condensing on cold surfaces. Crawl spaces are filled with plumbing, wiring, ductwork, and stuff that is probably in need of repair. And tradespeople do not like slithering on their bellies in a crawl space to fix stuff. The only civilized way to deal with a crawl space and to fix it, and this may sound extreme, but it's not, is pull up the floorboards. Pull them up carefully, label them so you can put them back down in the original position. And now you can work from above. You can dig out the debris and the rodent feces. You can fix the plumbing. You can fix the rotted beams. You can insulate the perimeter. And you always want to insulate the perimeter of a crawl space, not the floor. And you never want to vent it to the outside as building officials will be fond of doing. You want to vent it into the basement and keep it a conditioned dry space. You want to put down a poly vapor barrier. You want to put a concrete slab over it to protect it. And now you've got a respectable crawl space that's not going to be the problem child in your home. Cellar ways are always troubling. Today, people call them bulkheads or bilco hatches. Water always leaks into the basement through the cellar way. It's an easy, easy entry point for rodents and critters. And it's an easy place for criminals and vandals to break into your house. People think they need an access to the basement directly from the outside, but they seldom really do. And if they have a good stair in the interior, cellar ways are really unnecessary. I always recommend removing them, block up the foundations, fill them in and plant some grass. Fireplaces are just for looking at. And Count Rumford's innovations aside, 
Fireplaces are not effective means for heating your home. And I've tried. But the minute you open the damper and light a fire, you are immediately sucking more air, heated air, up the chimney than the heat you are radiating back into the space. And if you've done a good job insulating the house and sealing up air sealing those drafty leaks, as soon as you light a fire, your house is gonna fill up with smoke because there's no longer enough natural infiltration to support the chimney draft. And the only way to get it to stop smoking is to open a window. And that kind of defeats the whole point of trying to heat with the fireplace. And I've been down the road of you know, learning how to cook in a fireplace. And it's a lot of fun to do a Thanksgiving dinner where you cook the apple pie and the bake oven and the, and the beehive oven and roast a turkey on a spit with a reflector oven and the firebox. And everybody with an old house should do that once and get it out of your system. And then subsequent Thanksgivings are cooked in the kitchen where they belong. Stick with natural materials. There's no place in an old house for hardy board siding or Azac vinyl trim or synthetic materials like that. Stick with natural materials. Your house, whether you like it or not, is probably filled with toxic stuff. Most notably asbestos, which you probably find everywhere and lead-based paint, which is probably on everything. And these are things that require professionals to remediate. They're highly regulated. And it's, it's tempting to you know, don your COVID face mask and shove the asbestos pipe insulation into a trash bag and dump it down to local landfill under cover of darkness. But that's illegal. And if you get caught, there are step penalties. So, Deal with responsible professionals when you're dealing with hazardous materials. Most old houses are energy pigs. They were not built to be energy efficient, certainly not by today's standards for new construction. And it's really our responsibility as old home owners and good earthlings to do everything within reason to make your old house energy efficient. So insulate them as best you can, put in efficient heating equipment and whatnot, and make the most effort that's reasonable to make it energy efficient, but don't expect to be able to bring it up to modern standards without trashing much of the architecture in the process. White plank floors are usually eastern white pine. And eastern white pine is not a hardwood and should not be treated as if it is. A lot of people, myself included, will at first come in with drum sanders and sand it down and put a couple of coats of polyurethane. And that's usually a catastrophe because it looks great at first, but the urethane doesn't hold up on pine. And when it starts to flake off, it comes off in sheets and you cannot feather it back in. And I love my dogs, but my dogs are really rough on the floors of my house. The only clear finish that I found really works on a pine floor is tongue oil. And it takes multiple coats, usually six or seven coats to build up a durable film, but you can patch it, you can feather in, recoat it if it gets abraded. Tongue oil saturates or sinks into the wood and penetrates. It doesn't sit on the surface the way urethane does. You don't have to live in a museum. It's sometimes tempting to become too immersed in the old house experience. And it's certainly noble to furnish your old house with period appropriate furnishings. But seeing you carried away, you don't have to become a reenactor. You don't have to wear period garb. It's okay to have a flush toilet 
an air conditioning and a microwave oven. You don't have to live like you're still in the 18th century. Beware of decorators. Interior decorators call any old antique house a farmhouse. And when they get their hands on one, they're determined to make it into a prize modernized farmhouse. And they will paint everything white. They'll bring in modern furnishing and carpeting. And they'll do everything in their power to make it look like a new house and disguise the fact that an old house has charm. So avoid decorators unless you happen to find one that is experienced with old houses and loves old homes. Be realistic about your budget. You will run into things you didn't expect. Everything will cost more than you expected. When you prepare a budget for your restoration project and you finally come up with a number you think is realistic, double it. You don't want to be caught halfway through a restoration project and find, holy shit, I'm out of money. So be realistic about what things really cost on a restoration project. And lastly, I'm just going to plug my book. Beverly mentioned it earlier, Antique New England Homes and Barns. It's available from Amazon.com and fine bookstores everywhere. So with that, we're pretty well on schedule for some questions. Wow, Jim, that was great. And you are right on schedule. Um, well, that covered a lot and we have some really great questions. So I'm just going to dive right into the questions. Um, and again, I think we will need that additional 15 minutes for those people who want to stay on from 1 to 115. We'll be doing that as well. Um, first question, I would think that sand, this is relating to sandblasting. In addition to sandblasting, um, in addition to the physical damage, would also release toxic historical materials as well, like lead. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So when you sandblasted your house, I'm assuming lead went flying everywhere. It on was the exterior. Years ago, the lead abatement regulations were not what they are today. Okay. Do you yeah. want to touch on those, Ted? Um, no, because I'm not an expert on no, them. Okay. Um, but just leave it said that there are regulations on how lead paints to be handled. Um, the guy that did the blasting put tarps down, collected the debris, and disposed of it. Where? Who knows? Um, but the soil around my house probably contains remnants of the lead from that adventure, without a doubt. So today, the containment of the lead paint is much more strictly controlled than it was 40 years ago when yeah. I did it. Okay, and for those viewers here, um, I'll be sending an email out either tomorrow or Monday, and I will put a little bit of information, or a link about how you can get some lead information. Um, okay, next one relates to sandblasting with dry ice. Yeah, dry ice is great. Um, it's a mild abrasive. Dry ice is most customarily used for dealing with fire damage. Mm. So it's really good at taking a light level of char and smoke damage off of wood. Um, and the beauty of dry ice is it evaporates. So you aren't left with a lot of the abrasive debris. You still have the stuff that it blasts off that you have to clean up. Um, it's not hard enough to take off much other than burnt charred wood. But it is, you know, there is a host of abrasives that are used. Uh, walnut shell uh, is used for removing paint. Um, baking soda is a very good mild abrasive that's good for cleaning up old brick. Um, and of course, as you mentioned, dry ice, and uh, I showed you the corn cob. So you chose corn in your house. What were you actually removing? Just sort of tidying up the timbers? Yeah, the, the, the timbers had this dirty grunge all over them. I was basically just cleaning them up. I just took the, the grunge off them. 
So would that be gentle? Would, is the corn more gentle than dry ice or less? If you compare um, it's those probably ones. a little more aggressive than dry okay. ice. Dry ice, I don't think, would have done quite as good a job. Okay. And it wasn't available 40 years ago. It's a newer technology. Okay. And then here's a question. What's the preferred method for stripping paint? IR, which I'm not sure what that even is, or heat. What's IR? Okay. So infrared heat oh, yeah. is... Um, <sighs> If you have lead-based paint and you use a heat gun on it, you're going to be breathing toxic fumes. So you need to have the respirators and all that sort of stuff. But it does do a good job of removing the paint without damaging the wood. Um, chemical strippers are always an option, but you know, methylene chloride, which is the best stripper, is extremely hazardous carcinogenic material that you want to limit your exposure to. Um, there's some other stripper compounds that are citric based and whatnot that are far less toxic, but um, less, less effective than methylene chloride. So th those are your options, chemical stripping and, uh, and heat. Or just want... orbital sanding, yes. Except that that releases the lead if you're if you're dealing with lead, right? That's correct. Yeah. And do you want to touch on, I mean, I realize you're not a painter, but sometimes people feel like they have to get all the paint off and maybe that's not necessary. Just do a um, good job prepping and feathering. Yeah, and for interior woodwork, I'd say absolutely. Touch sand, alkyd primer and top coat. Outside's another story. And if you have multiple layers of old paint that's alligatoring and starting to fail, you have to get it down to bare wood. That putting new paint over failed paint is not a smart move. Okay. And I wanna get back to paint problems and moisture, but let's get through our questions and then we can go back to that. What do you recommend when replacement windows have already been installed? I think you touched on this. Um, and then also an old shingles removed, replaced with vinyl siding. Well, you know, if you have replacement windows, then by all means, replace them with something that's more appropriate. Um, and the nice thing about vinyl siding is usually it was put over the old siding. So when you strip off the vinyl siding or even asbestos shingles, you'll usually find the beat up old clapboards underneath them. So it's then a, you know, just a matter of restoring what you find. Okay. And you wanna to touch on the importance of quality clapboards? <laughs> and paint adhesion? Yeah, well, of, of course, you know, that, um, you know, modern clapboards, of course, are Western red cedar. That was not an option 200 years ago. So usually you have some other native softwood that was used that is less durable. So uh, when you are replacing clapboards, I don't think there's anything wrong with using Western red cedar. Um, there is a radially sawn clapboard that's often used for restoration which was <sighs> takes a whole log like a lathe and then the saw cuts a series of slices out of it so every clapboard is radially sawn and straight grained usually that's done with spruce that is filled with knots so then they have to take them and cut them up into short pieces that don't have knots in them so if you go with radially sawn clapboards, it's sometimes more historically correct, but you're piecing in a lot of short pieces rather than having a 25 foot long red cedar clapboard that makes the entire run. So cedar, I think it's a good compromise. Okay, I gotta put a plug in for Ward Clabbered Mill in Vermont. They do radial sawn, both pine yeah. and spruce in different lengths. 
Okay, next question. Is a trap door in the basement also a smoke or smoker or is that for cleaning ash? That's for cleaning ash, yes. So older homes had a ash dump in the floor of the firebox. And the idea was you would have to deal with the mess of cleaning up the ash in your living room. You shovel them into the, uh, the ash dump and then clean them up in your basement. Um, that's usually a later thing that you start to see in late 20th century, I'm sorry, late uh, 19th century, early 20th century homes. Okay, here's a great question relating to radon. It says, we were in the process of buying a house that has stone basement with dirt floor. It ended up having very high radon levels and the only solution was to spray seal the basement walls, pour a concrete floor and then use a sub slab system to extract the radon. They didn't buy the house. Is, is that the way you would have dealt with it? Uh, it? It sounds extreme. So with radon, you have two options. One is to uh, <clears throat> either vent it and evacuate the radon or to try and seal it out. Sealing it out is usually not worthwhile. If you have an earthen floor, you have no choice. You have to put a, a vapor barrier and a slab down before you put a vent system in. Um, but the reality is most of the bedrocks in New England, and we're talking about the granite state here, are igneous rocks and metamorphic rocks that off-gas radon. And it's not unusual to find radon everywhere in New England. So in an old drafty house that leaks, the radon that comes into the house is diluted and vented to the outside naturally. Once we insulate them and air seal them, we start to trap the radon inside them. So a radon evacuation system is not uncommon, an uncommon need in an old house. And they're not usually cost prohibitive things to install. It's usually a couple of thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, still in the basement, why do you not want to vent the basement air to the outside? So this is related to tightening up the basement. Yeah, so the, the old conventional wisdom was you vent crawl spaces to the outside and you vent attics to the outside. And all that was based on some research that was done in the 1930s that is no longer believed to be the best approach. And what venting a crawl space to the outside does is it brings in cold, damp air into the house in the wintertime and warm, damp air in the summertime. Neither of those are good things to do. And what is now the belief of building scientists today, the best approach is to insulate the perimeter of the crawl space, make the crawl space air condition space that's vented into the basement, not to the outdoors. So you're keeping damp outdoor air outside and keeping conditioned air inside. And the same goes for the attic, that you don't want to be bringing damp air into your house. And if you insulate the floor of your attic and ventilate the attic to the outside, and then you put your HVAC air handlers in the attic and all their ductwork, those systems are working overtime to keep up with the heat loss into the unconditioned attic space. You're better off insulating the plane of the roof and making the attic space conditioned space and not vented to the outside. Interesting. Um, and that's, I've talked to many different preservation contractors and they all have different ideas. So it's, it's really confusing on how to handle an attic. So when you say insulate, because a lot of guys will say, keep a cold roof, but you're, that, you're not saying that. Well, Correct? you can have a cold roof, which means that you just need to have airflow above the insulation okay. so that you don't have ice damming in the wintertime. So and how would you, just a basic colonial with timber frame 
roof, how would you insulate that? Rigid? Use a foil faced ISO sand rate rigid insulation board secured to the underside of the rafters and then vent the rafter spaces. Okay, so you need a ridge vent and soffit vents. Yeah, unless you have wood shingles, in which case the air just infiltrates right. out through the gaps between the shingles. You don't really need to provide soffit vents and, uh, and ridge vents, they will vent themselves. Okay, that's a whole nother program. We might have to do that yes, one. Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, and then here's just a comment. This preservation should go viral. And I just wanted to let Jessica know who wrote this, that we are recording and it will be on our website. So people can view it again. Um, I've been trying to get companies out to estimate on structural repairs, large sill beam repair, but they're all booked. That is a problem we're all having. Any advice on getting professional companies out in a timely manner? Yeah, that's, I wish. A, that's a tough one. Everybody's struggling with that this year. There's no easy answer to that. Yeah, and even in the absence of a pandemic, um, people that are good at what they do have a backlog of work and you have to be willing to wait for them and get on their waiting list. Yeah, so I mean, we have an online directory of preservation products and services, um, but I would definitely encourage everybody to do all their calls now to set up even for next summer because I have heard a lot of contractors are booking for 2023 already. But you may be able to find some for next year. But to find someone to come uh, this year, probably not. Yeah, it's not just the contractors, availability of materials. Well, that's true. Also. Yeah. And sometimes to get common things like insulation, you might have to wait six months for it. So order stuff early, plan ahead. All right, aside from price, what other metrics would you use to gauge the quality and capability of a contractor for historical work? That's a great question. I think, yeah, I think referrals and look at their work and try and ask around and find somebody that loves work on old houses. And most builders and carpenters would rather build a new house than work on an old house. So you have to find that guy that has the passion for working on old homes and the Preservation Alliance is probably a good place to look for those referrals. Yep, we do have a list. Um, also, I always encourage people, if you see a contractor working at a historic house in your neighborhood, stop by, introduce yourself, see what they're doing, if they'll show you around. That's always a good way to meet and speak with the property owner. All right, here's a good question. Who assesses structural issues in an old house? How do you find them? You need a structural we, engineer for that. Yeah. Who has experience with timber frames? Correct, and old houses. And old houses, yeah. Because they're not necessarily the same thing, yes. Yeah. So Preservation Alliance could definitely help with that. Um, here we go. We have a, or our house is 1857, built into a hill and has a dirt floor in the basement, obviously. We've been talking to builder about removing part of the earth to lay a moisture barrier in concrete. However, another builder thought an attempt to remove earth would undermine existing fieldstone foundation wall. Does digging up existing dirt floor and adding concrete floor threaten fieldstone walls? Good question. Okay, so, so the issue is a lot of these rubble stone basement walls, the bottom of them may only be a couple of inches below the earthen floor. So you can dig down as long as you don't dig below the bottom of the stone walls. So digging out a few inches of soil, putting down insulation, a vapor barrier, and a slab is a great idea, but you have to be careful not to undermine the foundations. Don't dig below the bottom of the stone walls. Okay. We have a lot of questions left, but I'm looking at my watch and we're getting close to one o'clock here. So I'm going to do my wrap up comments and we'll pick the door prize winner. So for those people who have to leave by one, feel free to do so. If you want to stay on and listen to the continue listening to the Q&A for another 15 minutes, please feel free to do so. 
So I want to thank Jim for his wonderful, informative presentation. We hope you gain some practical information and helpful tips to guide you with your old house projects. Thoughtful and experienced presenters like Jim and your great questions and involvement make a huge impact on advancing preservation efforts and interests across New Hampshire. We want to know, want you to know the Alliance is here to help and encourage you to check out our website at nhpreservation.org or send us an email to bt at nhpreservation.org at any time. Our next virtual program will be our seven to save announcement on Tuesday, October 26th at 5 p.m. We'll be announcing our 2021 threatened and endangered properties list. Visit our website calendar at nhpreservation.org for details on seven to save and other upcoming programs. We encourage you to share our website link with other historic property enthusiasts and be sure to check out our expo guide of 50 products and service provider on the expo page of the website. For those of you who have participated in our expo in the past, you know we love to give away door prizes as a token of our appreciation of your participation. Today's door prize will prize winner will receive a copy of A Building History of Northern New England by retired New Hampshire State architectural historian James L. Garvin. It's a wonderful resource offering a wealth of information about historic building materials and architectural styles and features. Like Jim's book, it's a must have for anyone interested in learning more in, about dating their historic homes. So I'll turn it over to my colleague, Maggie Steer, who's gonna announce today's lucky winner. And who is that, Maggie? It is Sid Schwartz. Sid, are you with us? If so, feel free to unmute mute yourself. I am. That just made my day. Yay, Sid. That made my week. Thank you. Can't see you. Oh, uh. There we go. Oh, there she is. Hello. Good. Yeah. Great. That's awesome. Thank you very much. So, and do you Sid, have an old house? Yes. It's well, 1864. We think. And that's why I have the 50 million rapid fire questions that they were kind enough to read and answer. And I really appreciate it. Oh, yours is our very next question after we do our wrap up. So I hope you'll stay on. I absolutely will. All right. I so I'll send a very, very urgent question because I have a lot of plastering to do. Okay. I'll connect with you on the book, mailing the book to you. Okay. okay thank you so much. All right. All right. So as I have already said, I'll be sending a follow up email. Um, with contact information for Jim, um, other additional links, and also a short survey, which helps us plan future programming. programming. So thanks again for Jim to the excellent presentation to our Old House and Barn Expo on the Road sponsors, which are list, listed here on the slide. And to all of you who are supporters of our critical work that helps to advance efforts to save and steward special places around New Hampshire. And please help keep the Preservation Alliance vibrant by making a donation or considering a gift membership. We wish you well and look forward to seeing you at future Alliance programs. Thanks for joining today. And please stay on if you have an additional 15 minutes and wanna continue the Q&A. And thanks for joining everybody. Jim, you can stop sharing screen if you want and we'll address these additional questions. Wonderful. And we have a lot of folks staying on, which is great. All right, we're gonna go right to Sid's question about plaster. What type of plaster do you use when replastering? Do you need to match the original plaster, horsehair, oyster shells, et cetera? Not really. And um, one question is, are you saving the old wood lath or are we going in with a whole new system? Um, <clears throat> we have two places one we have to replace the like a square of lath and another place the lath is there but just needs apparently they put gypsum board over a section in the bathroom like right on top of the lath but it's like super uh it's like kind of rotten and it's causing a crack up the rest of the plaster and it's like a curved bathroom wall mm. and so I've dug it out a little bit, and now I just need to figure out how to fill it in. Okay, so um, the, the modern systems for plastering, which are not inappropriate for an old house necessarily, are 
um, a blue board lath, which is like a sheetrock, except it's got a paper face on it that the plaster adheres to, that you apply a, a thin white coat over it, which mm -hmm. is an imperial uh, coat plaster. And that's what most modern plasters do. And that's not inappropriate in old house. Mm -hmm. um, if you're going over the old wooden lath or wire lath, then you're looking at a three coat system. And scratch coat and brown coats are generally done with a, um, a plaster base, uh, base coat and product name is Structolite for the base coats. It's a uh, okay. base coat plaster with a perlite aggregate. And then the final coat is your white coat, which is the same thing you use over a blue board. Um, and that gives you the smooth white finish. With that said, a smooth white finish doesn't always look best on an old house. Mm -hmm. And what I am fond of doing is using the Structolite, the base coat material, as the finished plaster surface because it's got a slightly ruddy texture to it. Mm -hmm. And what I've had good success doing is mixing pigment with the plaster. Ooh. So you never have to paint the wall. Ooh. And the wall comes out with sort of like a mottled colored surface. Mm -hmm. And what you do is you use the same exact pigment that is used for pigmenting paint. And you go to the paint store and have them give you the pigment in paper cups. Mm -hmm. And you pick your paint color, and then you take the same amount of pigment that goes into a gallon of paint and add that to the mix of one bag of Structolite plaster. And do some test samples, of oh. course, on the wall. But that gives you a really cool look. And if you buy my book, you'll see some photos in there of examples of that. It's my next trip. <laughs> okay. Um, no, but that's really cool. It also makes some sense too, because I didn't know, I mean, I guess I knew you could pigment plaster, but like for frescoes, but I didn't realize they, because I think they did that because it's like, there's like a pink plaster coat. And then under that, underneath that, there was like a, like a gold plaster looking coat. Was that something that they were done? actually painted on the plaster while the plaster is still wet and the paint sinks into it. So that's slightly different. Right. But you have these things called Venetian plasters that are uh, clay based plaster where the color is integral with it. Uh, okay. But that's a softer material. I find pigmenting a, a, a regular commercially available plaster based material. Mm -hmm. Is the most durable. But the Structolite, you can put it on the, um, like it's not gonna have any problem marrying to the old plaster. No, no. Well, I, I should say it will bond to the old lap. If you're putting it over the plaster mm -hmm. and the plaster, particularly if it's been painted, you have to add a bond coat first. And okay. there's a product called Plaster Weld made by Larson Products. That's this pink emulsion that you paint on that creates the bond coat that allows the structural light to stick to the old plaster. Cool. Thank okay. you. That we, was awesome. All right. We have a lot of questions here. We better get going. Um, how best to insulate exterior wall of the crawl space? This is the only time when I say spray urethane is a good idea because it's the only thing you can effectively do over a rubble stone crawl space wall. And <clears throat> since the stone is immune from dampness problems, it doesn't suffer the same issues that you have if you use urethane over a wood frame roof structure. So, if you're insulating crawl spaces, the spray foam is your best bet. I don't say that about many applications. Do you recommend repointing before you do that? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see. Lots of thank yous. Oh, 
I think we hit them all. Um, does anyone else have additional questions? I have a few, but I want to go with you guys first. If you have a question, feel free to unmute yourself. And go um, ahead and ask. Sorry, I'm going to buy the book, but um, <laughs> for repointing, I heard some controversy about, or I was reading some controversy about what to repoint with for the basement, like the type of plaster, how hard it should be. Do you have any thoughts or feelings about that? Yeah, so the the mortar should always be softer than the masonry units. So this is super critical with brick walls. So if you're repointing an old brick wall, you have to use a soft lime-based mortar. If you're repointing a stone foundation wall, you don't have to care so much because a Portland cement mortar is still going to be weaker than the stone. So it's okay to use a Portland mortar on a stone foundation wall. But if you're repointing old brick wall, brick walls, use a lime mortar. Okay. Do you have a suggestion about where to find lime mortar? <laughs> okay. Or do you just like so, take lime and add water? Okay, so you have you have a couple of options, right? So the Readily commercially available product is hydrated lime, a type S lime. And you mm -hmm. buy that in a bag and it has been hydrated. Mm -hmm. And um, just mix it with water and sand and a little bit of Portland and you're on your way. It's commonly used as a to mix with cement for masonry construction. Mm -hmm. Then you have natural lime mortars that are historically correct. And there are companies that make this stuff like Virginia Lime Works and they sell it in five gallon tubs. It's been slaked and uh, you just take it out of the tub and put it on. Um, if you try and buy a quick lime and they're sometimes available and then you slake it yourself, that's quite a messy operation that I do not recommend. And dangerous. Yes, it's dangerous because it's an exothermic reaction and you can get the thing boiling and uh, it's, uh, it's dangerous. And of course the, uh, the lime in that condition is, uh, is caustic. Sid, I'll try to include some links about sources for okay. lime mortar. Thank you. That would be yep. amazing. Yep. Any other questions? A lot of folks still out there. No. All right, Jim, I, I just do have one question. Um, well, I have a lot of questions here, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Relating to humidity and moisture levels in the basement, because this hits home for me because I have a very damp basement and I end up running. I, I learned the hard way. Um, I used to open up the basement windows and let the air go through. And then I realized in the summer that was awful because all the cold water pipes started dripping and it was wrong. So I closed everything up and I used a dehumidifier and it seems to be great. Um, I still have a dirt basement and I know that I need to put a vapor barrier down there, but I haven't done it yet because it's so much work for our basement. But anyway, so when you do what you had recommended for crawl spaces and venting it into your basement, you're also saying use a dehumidifier, correct? Absolutely. Okay. And what's your target humidity level? Relative you want to be below fifty percent. Ideal well, is thirty. Ideal is thirty, but fifty is a more realistic target for an old house. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, and then, since we're heading into cold weather, do you have like three top priorities for getting ready for winter that you would like to share with everyone? <laughs> Well, make sure your boiler is tuned up and your oil tank is full. Other than that, uh, you know, just make do the best you can at insulating and sealing your house and have efficient heating equipment. And clean the chimneys if you're using a wood stove. We didn't talk about wood stoves. What are your feelings on wood stoves? 
I love wood stoves. Um, and my remarks about heating with wood in a fireplace do not apply to wood stoves. Um, wood stoves are energy efficient. I've got a wood stove in my house that I run all winter. I've got one in each of my barns and I've got a limitless supply of wood. So I'm burning wood all winter and I love the quality of wood heat because you can come in out of the cold and stand in front of the wood stove and it warms you completely. And you don't get that same sensation standing over the air register. So um, I'm a big fan of wood stoves. I'm not a fan of sticking them in a fireplace and venting them into an old flue. So in my own home, I ran a separate stainless steel flue up through the roof for the wood stove. And that's the most efficient way for a wood stove to operate. So how about um, having an outside air source for your wood stove? Do you um, I don't think it's necessary. That it doesn't need so much combustion air that you need an outdoor air source. For a fireplace, you need large volumes of air just to create the draft. And you don't yeah. need that with an airtight wood stove. Okay, great. All right, I'm looking at the time. We're past 115, but there was one other question I wanted to address. Someone just wrote in, our old house got our old house got a real but partial basement with windows. Should we block those windows? I guess the answer is yes. If they right? no windows are fine as long as they're not open. <laughs> so. Bringing natural light into a basement is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, but close don't them, to... don't leave them open for venting. That's correct. Okay. All right. I think, and another big thank you. So, Jim, lots of thank yous for a great presentation. Um, and I want to thank you as well. It was really fabulous. And um, I know we probably have lots more questions. Um, I will include Jim's contact information if you have a specific question for him. I encourage you to read his book because you may get lots of answers there. And if you have other questions, I'd be more than happy to answer if you want to send me an email. Um, so thank you all for being great stewards of your historic houses. Stay warm this winter um, and have a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.